Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, I am delighted to welcome back Kwame Scruggs to the show. Kwame, you were on, I think, in 2021, so it's been a few years. It's been a while. It's delightful to have you back, and I'm so excited to hear about uh, what you've been doing since. But um, first, in terms of introduction, I want to start with my, pers- my personal introduction to Kwame, um, and then I'll, I'll share the official, the official introduction. Um, Deb and I were actually teaching at the New York Young Foundation, and it was a small group, lovely group of people that we were teaching. And so we went around the room and everyone introduced themselves. And and Kwame, you were there. And I remember you, you said, I use myth to work with inner city youth. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I thought, you know, then I then we went on and we did our thing, but I was um I was like, I have to talk to him because one of the things I, I love about your work is, um, you know, I'm a very strong believer that, that a, a symbolic perspective, a mythological perspective, a, a Jungian perspective can bring a lot of healing to many different areas of life. And I'm always, um, of course, as analysts, we work one-on-one with people in the consulting room mostly. But it seems to me that there are opportunities to share this wisdom in other arenas. And I'm always really excited when I see someone doing that. And that is exactly what you do. And that's what we're going to be hearing about today. So here is the official bio. Kwame Scruggs is the founder and director of Alchemy, Inc., and has over 20 years of experience in using myth in the development of urban youth and adults. He holds a PhD and an MA in mythological studies with an emphasis on depth psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara, California. In 1993, he was formally initiated into the Akan System of Life Cycle Development, which is an African-based rites of passage. And in 2012, Alchemy was one of 12 programs to receive the National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Award by the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities, the nation's highest honor for after-school and out-of-school programs. Kwame accepted this award from First Lady Michelle Obama at the White House. That must have been something. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. In 2020, the Association of Teaching Artists with Lincoln Center Education presented Kwame with their Innovation in Teaching Artistry Award. In 2016, he was one of three to receive the University of Akron's Black Male Summit Legacy Award. And in 2013, Pacifica Graduate Institute presented him with the initial Wendy Davey Award for Outstanding Service and Contributions in the Tradition of Soulful Service. That is beautiful. I love that. Kwame is also a board member of the Joseph Campbell Foundation and a graduate of the National Guild Community Art Education's Haley Community Arts Education Leadership Institute, Class of 2015, and a BME Fellow 2017. And uh, so... So I uh, spent the whole teaching morning or whatever I was doing, like, he can't leave before I talk to him. <laughs> and I think afterwards, I like made sure I came right up to you. I said, wait, tell me more and tell me more. And you had some literature. And I just was like, this is, this is fascinating. So I've been a big fan of your work ever since then. And it's, um, I'm so excited to hear more about it today and uh, really looking forward to diving into it with you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. And Joseph. Good to see you, Kwame. You too, brother. You're doing some deep 
soulful work in the world, which uh, we try to stay abreast of. You've got some new things that you are in development, and you're trying to sustain some things that have good momentum. But I thought it would be important for our listeners and viewers to get a sense of the work you do and how you came to it, how this came to be so yeah. significant to you as a human being. Well, but, but first also, like, or maybe in that, just make sure like you describe what it is that yes, you do. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, okay. Great. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. So, so it started while uh, it started. <laughs> Back when I went, uh, when I went through the African base rites of passage, as, so I was around thirty-seven years old then. So I'm, I'm mm. sixty-six now. And uh, when I went through that African base rites of passage, that's when I was introduced to the work of Carl Jung. Okay, I was introduced wow. to the work of Jung through the African base rites of passage. I was introduced to the work of Joseph Campbell through the African base rites of passage. So I started reading Jung, and I was just amazed at, uh, I, I read Portable Jung, and I was amazed at his chapter on the phenomenology of self and, and about the shadow and the anima and the wise old man, and then, then, then the chapter on synchronicity. So I started reading more Jung, and then I started to read uh, Joseph Campbell, Power Myth. And uh, I, I was reading some other Campbell stuff, but I just, what amazed me was that reading all these different myths no matter where they were from, they were basically saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then, and then Campbell's one sentence, uh, when you follow your bliss, doors open where you thought there'd be no doors. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was 38 years old at the time, looking out my window, University of Akron, and I asked myself, what was my bliss? I asked myself, what was it that I wanted to do? Not what could I do? What did I uh. want to do? And my exact words, my exact words were play my drum and tell mythological stories. Okay. So let me back up. Let me back up. So uh, I got introduced. Uh, af after reading Jung Campbell, I got introduced to the work of Michael Mead. And mm -hmm. so, and so <laughs> I read Mead's book, Men in the Water of Life. I read that book four and a half times. I purchased God. that book for over 170 some people. I still got the names in the back of the book who I purchased and gave that book to. But, but basically what I found, um, uh, because at the time I was at the University of Akron and I was counseling like urban youth. I was counseling primarily male youth. And it was like pulling teeth, getting them to talk. And, and from reading mm -hmm. Mead's book, the first two myths dealt with the father-son relationship. The next two dealt with mother-son relationship. Then he had a myth that dealt with initiation through sorrow and, and one that dealt with initiation through desire. And any initiation is going to be a symbolic death and rebirth. And so from reading that, it just helped me to understand so much about my life just from reading mm -hmm. a myth and, and, and listening to his interpretations. And so from that... Uh, I said, well, I'm going to start using this with the youth and the adults because I was running parent workshops. So that's what I started to do. <laughs> I just started using because it because it helped me to understand so much about my life. Because what I found is that, generally speaking, if you tell somebody they're doing something wrong, quote unquote wrong, <laughs> it's just it's just natural to become defensive. But if you tell them through a myth, you remove them from the situation and, mm -hmm. and then it allows you to look at the situation objectively. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say for a good five, six years, I just lived off the work of, of me. OK, I was just doing I was just doing the, the hunter and the sun myth, the, the water of life myth, the firebird myth, uh, the half boy myth. And then uh, and then I start working. <laughs> I start working with high school dropouts in Akron and Cleveland. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm not going to be able to just keep doing it this way. And so because I, I, cause I'm going to have these boys for a year, I'm going to have these boys for an entire year. So what I did, I just started to find other myths. I started to find other myths and create questions, create questions that went to each portion of the myth. Because I would tell a portion of the myth, stop at critical points. And then ask them what resonated with them in the myth. No right or wrong answers. No right or wrong answers just to create discussion. And then I would just, have, you know, then I would have questions for each portion of that myth here again to create, to create uh, discussion and just to get you to think. And uh, wherever I went, it, it worked. 
And it's it's just <laughs> I just been in, I've been in the right place at the right time and just surrounded by the right people. So that's how the doors it started. opened. Yeah, the doors so yeah, that's opened. How it, yeah, so yeah. that's so that's how it started. Um, and when you say it worked, okay. So so I got I have three anecdotal stories, but I'll tell you two of them. I'll tell you two. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, because when I first, you know, doing it, folks was like, what is he doing? Okay, what is he doing? <laughs> and uh, because, because when I was, you know, when I was telling people, I wanted to play my drum and tell mythological story, but people were like, who end up going to pay you to <laughs> play your drum and tell mythological stories? Okay, so anyway, so uh, working with the high school dropouts in Akron, in Akron. And uh, we were doing the water of life myth. And uh, in this myth, the boys are crying. Okay, the boys are crying because their father, the king, is sick. And they're sitting on the castle steps crying. These high school dropouts, now, now these young men were like ages 16 to like 22. They took it upon themselves. We were near the end of the year. But they took it upon themselves to go around that circle and talk about the last time they cried. These high school dropouts, okay? So, so, so you know, awful. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, so I'm like, wow, this myth is the ticket, okay? That was the first mm-hmm. one. And then the second time I was in Cleveland working with high school dropouts. And in Cleveland, um, the, the gentleman would give me like 30 of them at a time, just me, okay? And I had them for like an hour and a half, three different sets of, 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 of youth hour and a half. I'm like, and, and, and at the time, Cleveland was like rated the poorest city in the country. It was ridiculous. Okay. There was no way that I was going to be able to keep the attention of 30 something high school dropout from Cleveland for hour and a half. So, so what I started to do, and I would go home and I'm like, I know I got have something to offer these youth, you know, through the myths and blah, blah, blah. So I told them, I, I came back to one day and I, I said, Hey, uh, I'm going to give you the first 15 minutes. You do whatever you want to do. I'll give you the last 15 minutes. You do whatever you want to do. But I said, that hour, that hour in between, you give me that hour. You give me that hour. We do these myths. So it was pretty chaotic, that first 15 minutes, the last 15 minutes. I'm letting them do whatever they want to do. It's in the summer. So they outside. They like freaking their black and mild, which is like stuff with cigars, okay, and blah, 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 blah. And just a lot of joking going around. I mean, it was cool, but it was chaotic. And it was their 15 minutes. It was their 15 minutes. It was chaos. And one of the youth hollered out. He was sitting in the back. He hollered out, Kwame, tell us another story. Uh-huh. And I was just like, wow, this is in their 15 minutes. And that's when I said, hey, this myth is the ticket. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, when I say it works, it, it, um, a friend of mine, Dunya, we, we're doing these workshops with Silverman, like, few weeks ago, she's like, wow, Kwame, you have created a simple method that uh, you've created a simple method that, 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 that makes people ask, answer complex questions, okay, oh, yeah, yeah. in an immediate amount of time. So wherever we go, it's, wow, it just, it, it, it works because it makes people you know, r- respond, really, really respond to the deeper questions in a simple way, in a simple mm-hmm. way. Well, it seems to me that it, we're, it, 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 uh, when you work with these stories, you're entering into the world of the imagination. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so before we start, before we start any myth, and, and in, in, in like a year, when we're with the youth for a year in school, you get maybe do three myths. Okay, it's according how long the myths are. Wow. But, but, but um, like, on a, like on a Saturday when we would have them for a Saturday, like four hours, it might take us, might take us three months to get through one myth. So like, in, so like in a seven year period, the youth that we had, like four to seven years, we might get through 25 myths, okay, in seven years. But you, 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 you're talking about setting the stage. And so we always have, we would tell the golden age, okay? Before each myth, we would tell the golden age uh, to get them in that, in that uh, mythic, mythic, a mythic space, okay? So mm-hmm. if we had time today, remind me to tell you the golden age before we mm-hmm. 
before we go off into a myth. Okay. Okay. okay great. Yeah. Well, Kwame, could you just frame, I, we'll probably go into it more, um, how you bring a myth to life with a group? Because I think many of our Jungians might read a myth to personally amplify it, or maybe they'll read the Book of Symbols or what Jung had said. But it takes a special skill to bring a myth, bring it alive for a group of people. And how, how do you engage them and unpack the myth such that it goes on for weeks or months? Well, wow, thank you. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. first things is that you, you got to set an environment uh, that, that they feel safe. Okay, so like the youth that we work with here again, we'll have them for like at least a year. Okay, if not three years, seven years. Um, but even with the adults, the first thing is creating a safe environment, uh, uh, letting people know that what's in that room stays in that room. And just, uh, I have like in a little agenda I go through and just really believing that, uh, I call it choosing the womb and, and how each of us were, you know, brought here to, to complete something on this earth. And, and the fact that we're in that room together, there's, there's far too coincidental for it to be coincidence. Okay, so you're setting the stage. First off, it's setting the stage and make a safe environment. And then through the myth, I, I, I'll tell the myth through the beat of a drum. Okay, tell the myth through the beat of a drum. And so, so just the drum, it, 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 it soothes you, puts you in a trance-like state. And then just, uh, like I say, we tell the golden age first, and then just tell the uh, tell that portion of a myth to the beat of a drum, uh, <laughs> they all have journals. They all have journals. There's no right or wrong answers. So that's another thing that, that makes it uh, a little more comforting. Okay. What's the questions that you're posing to them mm -hmm. that bring so, them forward into so, the process? So like, so like with the water of life, and I wasn't going to do that one today. I, we only get through a little bit, but the other myth I was going to do, I haven't done in a long time. So I'm like, Let's just do the water life, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so in the beginning, uh, should we? You, should we? You want me to give me an example? Do, you want, should we just do give it me an example? Right yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. That'd okay. be great. So, okay. I All mean, right. I've, I'm lucky enough to have been to have participated uh, in your process, uh, so I okay. it's it's okay. remarkable. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Let me back up a little bit here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got my back up a little bit more. Mm hmm Yep. You hear the drum? Yes. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to do the golden age first. I'm going to do the golden Great. age. Okay. And this is what we do before, before each new myth. Before each new myth, we tell the golden age. So in the golden age, this was a time when everything, when I say everything, I mean everything, was created with a sense of enchantment, a sense of wonderment, a sense of beauty. It was a time when there were no doors because people had nothing to hide. It was a time when all people ate were fruits and vegetables because the concept of killing had not been thought of. It was a beautiful time. It was a time when it was perpetual spring. It was a time when all the gods and all the goddesses and all the heroes and all the sheroes walked amongst the earth with the living beings so they knew what it was like to treat one another with love and with honor, with respect and with dignity. It was a time when the sun and the moon sang as a duet and the galaxies danced. However, and like we tell our youth and adults, there's always a however. On this particular day, evil came into the world and when evil came into the world doors were invented killing was invented all the guys and all the goddesses and all the heroes and all the sheroes went on the ground never to be seen again so the people they were searching around for that golden age because they missed that golden age and they searched around high and low near and far, but they couldn't find it. Rumor has it that that golden age was hidden 
and myths and fairy tales. Mm -hmm. And when you pull a group of people together and you tell them a myth or a fairy tale, they are once again reminded of that golden age. And so today we're going to re-enter that golden age through the myth of the water of life. So I'm gonna go just the beginning of the water of life, okay? Great. Okay, so I'm just gonna yeah, tell yeah. the beginning awesome. of the water of life. So once upon a time, in a time before we knew the name time, in a time when the grass was blue and the sky was green, there lived this king, and this king he was sick, and when the king is sick, the entire village is sick. Now this king he had three sons. And these three sons, they were sitting on the castle steps and they were crying because their father, the king, was sick. An old man just happened to walk by and when he saw them crying, he asked what was wrong. He said, why are you weeping? And the son said, we are crying because our father, the king, is sick. And the old man says, I know where a cure is, but it's difficult to get to. This is called the water of life. Well, the oldest son thought that if he would inherit or secure the water of life, that he would become his father's favorite and inherit his father's kingdom. So he went to his father and asked, could he go in search of the water of life? And his father said, no, it is far too dangerous. But that oldest son didn't give up and he kept asking his father and the father relinquished as some fathers do. And the oldest son, he mounted his horse and he left out of the castle in search of the water of life. And the dwarf was standing on the right side of the road and the dwarf asked him, where are you going in such a hurry? And the oldest son said, none of your business, you little runt. What business is it of yours? And he had his horse kick up dirt, dirt to the face of the dwarf and the dwarf did not take too kindly to that. And he cast a magic spell on the oldest son. And the further and further that he rode, the mountains enclosed upon him and his horse. So he did not return. And he might as well have been in jail. Because he didn't return, the king remained sick. And when the king is sick, the whole village is sick. And I'm going to stop right there. And we just have them write down what resonated with them and that portion of the myth. So we just had them write down what resonated, okay, in that portion, and they go around. They sit in a circle by age, youngest to oldest, okay, hmm. two reasons, two reasons for sitting in a circle by age. One is to provide a sense of order in a chaotic world, and because you have your space, there's no reason to be jealous of anybody else's space. The uh, second reason they sit in a circle by age, because it's up to the oldest to look out for the youngest. Hmm. Okay, so, so for right there, for that little section right there. Uh, here again, you write down what resonates with you in the myth. No right or wrong answers, okay? They all have journals. Like, like alchemy, everything is uh, black and red and white, okay? Mm -hmm. So they all have journals. And like, so like uh, the youth now who are 30 years old, they, you know, they started in sixth grade. And so so cool for them to go back you know, and look at what they wrote in sixth grade. But So the first thing, what resonated with you? No right or wrong answers. And they say, when this happened, when that happened, when this happened, and so then, you know, you just create discussion. Discussion is created right then. So like the first thing, first question, uh, ask them, what does a king do? Okay, what does a king do? And they just, you know, you, you write down first thing that comes to your mind for the most part. So the next question, what is the king in your life right now? Okay, mm. so, so, so they have to identify what's the most important thing to them right now in their life. Like I say, if the king is sick, the entire village is sick. All right. So, uh, uh, then the, so we'll have them identify that, and we'll talk about that situation. Oh, then crying uh, when they're on the castle steps, crying, crying is a sign that something is wrong. Okay, so we we tell them that if they sitting on the castle steps acting like nothing is wrong, then that old man gonna walk by. Okay. So that and so then it goes on and on and on. And when, yeah, 
Yeah. So you might so spend like several hours just on that portion. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 So it's interesting when we do the myths, especially with adults, with adults, because they have so much more life experience to reflect mm. upon. So yeah, that right there, we could spend, we could spend like with adults, let's say it's 10 people in the room. Yeah. We could be on that with two hours. Okay. Cause here again, there's no right or wrong answers. And so then, you know, when you identify, okay, when was the last time you cried? Okay. Mm. And then, then just talking about that, but here again, you just keeping it, you know, what's said in this room stays in this room. So that's an example. And in the group, uh, would all the boys be speaking as a, 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 so, a solo voice in the midst of 10 people, or did you break them into smaller no, groups? No, 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 they, they all speak. That's the one thing, too, about, um, about our groups. Um, like our first core group, we had like 28. Okay, so like on a Saturday. On a Saturday, we average a good 20, 20 you know, on a Saturday. So they sitting there, uh, and each of them have to respond. Okay, okay, they have to respond. Here again, there's no right or wrong answers. What's said in that circle stays in that circle. Uh, and, then, and then what you find out too, in the, in the method, uh, because they are hearing the same myth, and you're just hearing different perspectives. You're hearing different, different perspectives. So one of the key things about the method is just having an open mind, okay, and, and listening to the opinions of others. Another thing you find out is when people, you know, are sharing their stories, you find out the rain does not fall on one roof alone. Right? <laughs> and are the other boys commenting on what someone says oh, or is yeah, it? Yeah. Yes. Oh, there's yeah. a conversation. Oh yeah. It's a conversation. It's a conversation. And it's just, it, it amazes me because like with the adults, the adults who are in the circle, so like the, the brothers who've been with me, uh, like I said, Alchemy, we're in our 20th year. So I had like one group, of, they were with us like for 10 years. The, the facilitators are with me now. I've been with us for like 10 years, okay? And basically all of, all of us, you know, went through like a, uh, a training in the method. And we, we've got that, a lot of us have that, uh, been initiated in the kind system of life cycle development. So, we, so we're coming with those different, uh, viewpoint. So ba basically, our philosophy, our foundation is based on Jungian psychology, uh, the kind system of life cycle development, and and just Joseph Campbell's work, the common themes and the myths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, so the 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 conversations it never ceases to amaze me because as the adults, uh, we share we share some deep stuff that's going yeah. on in our life so that so that we can be used as a mirror which will allow them to choose another reflection okay mm -hmm. so the things that are shared in that circle out of the, you know and they're shared because of the trust the trust mm -hmm. that the thoughts have in us and the, the trust that we have in them because I, I mean we share some really personal things you know in that circle yeah, yeah. i bet and and um, gosh, there's there's so much to react to. First, first, I I want to just clarify that Alchemy is the name of the nonprofit yes, that you started. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, that's done this wonderful work and was profiled in this really beautiful film, uh, The Gold Within. Yeah, is that, do yeah. I have the title? Finding right? Finding the Gold finding Within. The gold within. Yeah, Kalina uh, Karina Epperline. She had, mm -hmm. we had a filmmaker out of Berkeley. She followed six of the youth for like three and a half years. So yeah. it's not a film about alchemy. It's a film about six youth in alchemy, uh -huh. but alchemy okay. serves as like the backdrop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a really, and it was just, um, it, it's just a very compelling film because it, it shows that this process that you're leading these young men through, it really is an initiation. I mean, and, and uh, the results are really remarkable. But I, yes. I did want to say, um, talking about the, the sense of trust and what comes up in the group, uh, I, I love your, your uh, aphorism there, the rain does not fall in yeah. one roof alone, because I yeah. think that when we're in the archetypal world, one of the things that's really powerful about it is we're in the realm of the universal mm -hmm. and we can understand our suffering yes. and our difficulties and our challenges and our joys within the context yes. of universal human experience. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, the one thing, too, about, about when, you, when you were talking, Lisa, the... What the primary objective I would say is uh, 
for the youth to become the hero within their own stories. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. so looking at the common themes and the myths and in, incorporating those common themes of the hero into your life, which is basically, you know, sacrifice, making sacrifices, persevering, overcoming obstacles, asking for help. Um, um, but yeah, that's what it's all about through the myths. Um, we do the myths while the myths do us. Okay. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's really great. That's really great. I'm imagining that leading these programs and developing them has changed you. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, right? So, so I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering that if someone were to take a kind of a snapshot of your wow. inside and outside when you started it, mm. and took a snapshot of your inside and outside now. Wow. What? Uh, wow. What might they see as as the transformative um, points? Wow. Thank you. Um, one of the things <clears throat> that I really focus on. Um, is you can't teach someone something you yourself do, do not know, and you can't lead them somewhere where you yourself are unwilling to go. So it's like before healing others, heal thyself. So um, I've, been in, I've been in therapy seven years with Jungian. Uh, uh, and, what, and what gets me by, <laughs> just what gets me by is uh, my therapy and the myths, and the myths. Okay, so. You really live these myths. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And, and, that, and that's what gets me by. So, wow, Joseph. Wow. I guess I would have to answer that because I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Uh, I guess what has changed for lack of a better word, is that I, uh, I'm living them out, okay? I'm, I'm, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, living them, I'm living them out. And uh, it's, what gives me, it's what gives me hope. It gives, it's what gives me hope to, to persevere so like, <laughs> and I'm laughing to keep from crying. But mm-hmm. um, like right now, um, the myth of the hunter and the bow constrictor. It's just like, hey, you got to put trust. You got to put trust in the universe that everything is going to work out in the end, even when you, even when you're sitting there, you know, in that belly of the whale. It, uh, it gives me hope. It gives me hope and it allows me to persevere. Okay. Well, it, it sounds like you've really created this very strong connection with the objective psyche. And you have this yeah. deep trust in the unconscious. <laughs> yes, uh, no doubt, no doubt. And as you know, <laughs> you got to be careful with that. You know, you got to be careful yeah, with that. You know, too. because yeah, so because so I'll, I'll speak for myself, but yeah, uh, so often I think we see what we want to see. You know, mm-hmm. that's the yeah. one thing yeah, with this true. method. That that's the one thing with this method. It makes you answer the deeper questions, okay, okay, about your life, and you, and you got to be truthful. You have to be truthful. And like I always tell the youth, when they when they writing down these responses, you can lie to us, but you can't lie to yourself, mm-hmm. okay. So yeah. it's like it's like, you know, for me, you know, going into an unconscious, it's like looking into a mirror. And if you if you, I, I hear again, I'm speaking for myself. Mm-hmm. If you really look deeply, there's going to be some things you don't like, you know, <laughs> there's going to be some things that you don't like that you see. And so the thing is, to, is to work on it. OK, to identify mm-hmm. it. And so that's another thing. That's another thing when they're writing down the responses. Like I'll tell them there'll, there'll be a few questions that's pretty deep. I'm talking about pretty deep questions. Mm-hmm. And um, um, like I tell them, if they don't. If they don't want to respond in a group setting. 95% of the time they have to respond, okay? Mm-hmm. But that might be that 5% chance you don't have to, but I tell them at least write it down. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. way it's acknowledged by your psyche. Yeah. At least write it down so that way it's at least mm-hmm. acknowledged by your psyche. Because like, so, so like give you an example of a tough question. We were doing this myth, uh, this one myth, and the, the, the parent, and, and so many of the myths deal with parent-child relationships, but the parent, 
The parent beat the child. The parent beat the child to death. And uh, because it was ashamed, it was ashamed of a child. And so one of the questions we asked, you know, do you, in what ways are your parents ashamed of you? Okay. Yeah. Hey, that's a deep question. That is. Okay. That that's, is. A deep, that's a deep question. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's. Uh... Our Patreon has had a makeover. There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. Patrons who support us at the $5 level and up will now access Young Love, weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by supporters. At the $10 level, you can vote on topics for podcast episodes and vote on which guests we invite. And at the $25 level, you'll also be able to watch behind-the-scenes content and even join us for occasional live events. If you'd like to be a part of all this, the link to our Patreon is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. Yeah, yeah, so it go, you, go, you go really, really deep. Yeah. You know, Kwame, it was so great. Um, having you uh tell the the myth with the drum and it's just a very unique way of hearing the story and i found myself thinking well first of all i had two thoughts one thought was god i wish i had a recording of you telling these stories with the drum it would just i mean even without the questions it just i could just imagine putting my headphones in and lying yeah. back and just listening yeah. to the story. Okay. Uh, and then I thought, you know, in addition to being a healer and a kind of modern day shaman with this, you're also a storyteller because you, you really tell the stories in a, in a beautiful rhythmic way. And I, I think that's a bit of a lost art to be a good storyteller. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, they say, uh, I got the idea with the drum through Michael Mead. Okay, okay. He was my mm-hmm. first men's workshop I went to. Michael Mead and Melodoma Some yes. came down here to Southern Virginia and just rocked oh, my world, yes. man. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, and that book, by the way, The Water of Life, yeah. I, that book is amazing. Yes. I love yeah. that book. So, so Michael's been to Akron five times to work with our youth, okay? But, oh, wow. But, uh, so I don't really, I don't consider myself a drummer, okay? I don't consider myself a storyteller. Uh, but, but, I but I appreciate that. From after, they say comparisons are never justified, but you only find justification through comparisons. So when I, when I, you know, see Michael me telling the myth or playing the drum, I'm no, I'm no storyteller. Okay. But thanks. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Hey, quick story, quick story, quick story. So like, so like our youth, uh, like I said, these youth are 30 years old now, but yeah, when yeah. they were, when they were in eighth grade, they, they were leaving seventh grade and I told them. It was near the end of the year, and I told him, I said, you guys going to spend a full day with Gerald McDermott, who's a Catacomb medal winner, studied under Joseph Campbell for 13 years. I said, you're going to spend an entire day with him at the end of the year, but starting off next school year, eighth grade, I'm going to pull you out of school. You're going to spend an entire day with Michael Mead. And, then, and I told him, that's where I got to learn what I'm doing. And one of the students raised your hand and said, Kwame, Kwame, does he do what you do? Like, tell the drum, playing the drum, tell the story. I'm like, yeah, when you meet Michael, you're going to be very disappointed in me. It's like, no, nah, Kwame, no, nah, Kwame. And so then they spent a day with Michael. <laughs> and this, <laughs> that was on a Friday. <laughs> they spent a day with Michael. And so we had our first session uh, that Monday after school. Stacy Starr coming to me, said, Kwame, you were right. Okay. <laughs> he, said, he said, he said, he said, he said, uh, he said, you're like our father, but Michael, he's like, God. Oh yeah. my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. my god! That's so yeah. cool. That's really great. Yeah. <laughs> that's fabulous! What a great story. Oh, that's such a great story. So, when you started Alchemy, you were working in the schools. Is that right? When I when I started, like, uh, yeah, tell us how you I, how did you find these these young wow, men? Wow! Here again, wow! Just right place, right time. So, uh, I was at when I first started using Myth. I was at University of Akron, Upward Bound. Uh, working in Upper Bound, okay. and then I was going to Pacific Cup. Okay, so I was I was traveling back and forth from Akron, Ohio, to Santa Barbara, California. Well, I only had so I only had enough vacation for one year. Okay, and so then I quit the next year. I quit. I quit Akron U. I've been there five years. I quit, and then I start 
to just get contracts, work with high school dropouts, blah, 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 and then in the charter schools. And I'm like, I'm like, all these people doing with the nonprofit, they just getting me the contracts. I'm doing the work. So then I'm like, I can do that. And so <laughs> little did know. I know, little did I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's when I started Alchemy. Okay, then that, so that's when I started Alchemy to get my nonprofit. Well, uh, it took me a while to get that. So I lived off my credit, my, my wife and son didn't even notice. I lived off my credit cards for nine months to pay the rent, okay, to pay the rent. Uh, uh, for, so nine months and then uh, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I was at this one school, Perkins Middle School in Akron. Uh, the year before I got my nonprofit, the Knight Foundation had given the school $5 million for after school programs. So the following year, I got my, my, my alchemy, got the nonprofit. But, but, that, but that prior year, I worked with five groups, uh, three groups for boys, two for girls, pretty much mm-hmm. for free. Okay, just running, mm-hmm. yeah, just yeah. running the myths. Okay, and it was like, wow, this, this shit worked. And uh, so the following year, uh, <laughs> I ended up getting that three-year grant from the Knight Foundation, and I had to, I had to recruit students. And so uh, uh, a friend of my son was at the school, and he helped me get students. And that, that's just how it started. That's how it started. We just started with an after-school program. I just happened to get the right the right students they were football players basketball players so they was kind of like you know big men on campus for sixth grade and then uh had them sixth seventh and eighth grade and then in ninth grade this one other school in the suburbs had an influx of black males they had heard about us and i combined i combined those those youth at what ninth they were ninth graders so that's how alchemy started Okay, so we had those youth four to seven years. We had a second core group like seven years. We had another core group for like six and a half because COVID hit. So we worked with over okay. 2,000 youth. But that, wow. that's how Alchemy started. I was just in the right place at the right time, kind of just a whole partial thing, just stumbling along. I just been in the right place at the right time, surrounded by the right people. Mm-hmm. They, say, they say only you alone can do it, but you can't do it alone. <laughs> that's yeah. great. Yeah. Well, mate, I want to. Uh... To, to just drop down a little bit. It was something I heard when you were talking. That, that soul voice hearing. And it occurs to me that um, in the work that you're doing with other people, that you are writing a myth about the birth, death, and resurrection of hope. Ooh. And you're writing that myth. Mm. Or you're telling that story. So I'm wondering when, when I offer that to you, your story, your myth about the birth, death, and resurrection of hope, what is your myth about that? Wow. Um, that's a good question, Joseph. Um, and you my- can break out the drum and wing it if you like. And I mean, <laughs> and I, and I mean that. You can tell, you can tell, you that I can feel that script is about three millimeters right below your conscious focus. I know that that's happening in you. I can feel it. Wow. Um, wow. Man. Hey, uh, if I start to tear up, uh, hey, like we tell our youth, so would have no rainbow, had the eyes, no tears. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's okay. Hey, it's like, really okay. like we say, it's because uh, you see this a lot of times in the myths that the, the boys are crying, but we say it's okay for boys to cry. Mm-hmm. So for me, wow, Joseph. Mm-hmm. Wow, once upon a time, There was a boy who was born and he didn't see anybody who looked like him. Do 
doing positive things. So he... He only saw images of him that were people who looked for slaves, butlers, and clowns. So he internalized that that was all he could be. Until one day, he was in this boat, a boat that he would go into every day. And one day he went out farther than he had ever been before. And he met some people who told him a myth. And in that myth, he found a lot of similarities to his life. And he started to have a better understanding that he was not alone and that everybody goes through something where they forget who they are. But people come into their lives to remind us who we are. And if we can just submit and listen and follow the roadmap that we've been given and make the necessary sacrifices and persevere, then we too can become the hero in our own story and find a place where we do belong and secure the water of life. And once we secure it, make certain that we come back to the community. to help those who themselves feel as if they do not belong. So there you go off the top of my head. Okay. That, was beautiful. that was beautiful and brave. Yeah, I love it. There you go off the top of my head. Yeah. I find myself thinking about the death of hope. The death of hope, yeah. Well, death of hope and what yeah, that, that, yeah, what that might mean in a child's psyche, yeah. in an adult psyche. Yeah. That, that is, uh, wow, when uh, we had our youth, and like I said, it's 20-some years, but we had the youth identify different common themes in the myths, okay? So we probably got about, 50, 100, something different common themes that they saw in the myths. And for me, for me, the, the first, I remember the first one when I did it was sacrifice. That was the thing that really mm-hmm. stood out. But, but what stands out to me now is hope. Mm-hmm. Myths provide us with hope. Uh, and you just, you can't give up. You can't give up. So the death of hope may be the death of the mythological the death of that yeah. layer of the deep yeah. unconscious. Of yes. course, it's a metaphor. Yeah. When life interferes with the child's ability to access the mythic level, yeah. something in them at least appears to die in as much go. as it slips out of their hand. And then the culture tells them, and their friends yeah, tell them who go. to be, and their teachers tell go. them who to be, and poverty and pain and misunderstandings and fighting and yeah. struggling. and deprivation all replace that that is not a myth but are these fragments of suffering layer over that mythic level mm-hmm. yeah well said well said uh yeah you can't give up hope uh, and so many of you know just like he said and and it seems to happen it might be happening sooner now but it seems like about fourth grade you know, that's when wow. you, that's when you, you know, the world, life gets in the way of living. Wow. Okay. Um, well, and you lose, you lose access to the water of life. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And that mm-hmm. magical thinking, that magical thinking that, that, uh, 
you grow up, you grow up for boys. I'm, I'm just speaking. For yeah, yeah. You grow, you grow up thinking that you could be Superman. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you find out society tells you, no, you can't. And then that's the whole thing about, you know, with Jung and that second uh, period of life. Hey, uh, refinding, re refinding that, that, that secret that yes, I can be Superman. Okay. So, so that brings me to, to something. I want you to go back to your story, which, which I've heard before, but it's so extraordinary that there you are, 36, 37, presumably, maybe a little older. And, and you're reading Joseph Campbell, and first you ask yourself the question, what is my bliss? Most of us don't ask ourselves that question. Yeah. But you ask the question, you let the answer come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the answer was, I want to play my drum yeah. and tell mythological stories. Yeah. And yes. then you did something extraordinary. You took it seriously. Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah, like I say, yeah, so it was like 37, I got induced to the rights pass, but it was 38 years old when okay. I, like I say, I'm staring okay. out my window, University of Akron, and ask myself, what did I want to do? Not what could I do? What did I want to do? My exact such, words. Such mm -hmm. a big the difference. Yeah. The desire. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so then uh, the internet had just come out, and I asked the secretary, could she find me a school that offered a PhD in mythology, and she couldn't. She couldn't. Uh, Ohio State came up with like folklore and then she found some other school and I just said, forget it. And I, I can't remember the time span when a friend of mine came in, threw a magazine on my desk. I still have it in my office. Common Boundaries, his exact words. Kwame, they have some interesting ads and articles in here. I'm flipping through it. See Pacifica Graduate Institute. Long story, long story. And uh, wow, one thing led to another. Wow. Like I say, I just been in the right place. I've been at the right place, the right, mm -hmm. you know, right time here again. Folks thought I was out of my mind because I quit my job at Akron U to still go. Uh, but, but they say those birds that fly the highest don't fly with the flock. Those who were seen dancing were thought to be crazy by those of whom could not hear the music. Okay. <laughs> well, you, you, in, in some sense, you had this, you did, re, you did find this water of life and you, oh, yeah. and you trusted it. Yeah. You trusted yeah. it against, yeah. really against the odds. Yeah. So, so, um, so, so many more questions to ask, but mm -hmm. I, d I do, I, d <laughs> we brought you on because we wanted to hear about alchemy in New York. Okay. Oh, so okay. tell us okay. about okay. alchemy in New York. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks. I forgot about it. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, wow. So I've been trying to get to New York for some time uh, and I, I, I would get to New York. Wow, six, eight times a year because of the because of the Jung mm -hmm. Center, you know, on East on East uh, 30, 39th, 37th. Anyway, it's twenty. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, I'm having here, the same thought. Which yeah. one is it? But yeah, yeah right yeah. around. There. Anyway, 39th, 39th. and um, so I would get here six, eight times a year, and you know, just the energy in New York. So was just seeing how could I get alchemy here? So um, ended up here again, right place at the right time. Found two independent schools that that let me uh, had me come in to run groups. Okay, one George Jackson Academy in the East Village, the other uh, De La Salle Academy up on uh, West Forty Third Street. And um, um, you know, here again the the youth the youth loving it. You know, the youth, primarily the sixth graders, okay? The eighth graders, they, they, they come and go. They come and go, <laughs> okay? But uh, so from just meeting the, the, the youth at George Jackson, and because I had them in the sixth grade, and that's what I wanted to do was start with sixth graders, both schools, yeah. but I couldn't at De La Salle, did the eighth graders. So um, plan now is to be, to stay with those sixth graders two more mm -hmm. years, seventh and eighth grade year on a monthly basis, okay? meet with them monthly uh, for two more years. And then also here again, with, through Silverman School of Social Work, Hunter College, uh, starting the training program to train people in our methods. So that should start uh, in January. We're, we're looking to start that in January. We have an information session coming up uh, June the 22nd, Saturday, June 22nd at Silverman School of Social Work. 
And, and is information about that on your website? Yes, it by is. The way? Yes, okay. by, on, on, on Alchemy's website. On and the Alchemy, website. yeah, okay. alchemyinc.net. Yeah, that's where you'll find the information. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, I'm that. just gonna push you just for a couple minutes here. Okay. So just hang with me. Okay. So uh, you know, we're we're believers, obviously. We're we mm -hmm. you know, we're we're really into this and we live in a data driven society. Okay. So is there data on your method? Please tell us about please, okay. please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh hey our for us to win that National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Award, I mean, that's the nation's highest honor mm -hmm. after school and out of school program. So, I mean, you have to provide all sort of data, yeah. okay, for them, uh, for you to be, be considered, okay? And so, I mean, with the grants, we have to provide data. Uh, let me give you some data off the top of my, my mm -hmm. head. Yeah. Our first core group, our first core group, uh, 28, those youth, 26 of 28 graduated high school on time. Uh, 24 of those 26 enrolled in college. God. Uh, now, this was back in 2011. Mm -hmm. of, so there are 29 and 20, 30 years old now. Uh, to date, 15 had their bachelor's degrees. Uh, five have master's degrees. One has a dual MBA in Jewish doctor. He serves on oh, our board. Okay. My um, uh, <laughs> now, now, I think a lot of those youth would have been okay with or without mm -hmm. alchemy. But the one thing that you find in what our youth, uh, if you sit down and have conversations with youth who've been in alchemy for a while, you can see their their critical thinking is on another level, okay, mm -hmm. because of their exposure, you know, yep. to the myths. So, like our data, so we have uh, we have plenty of data. Um, but for me, I'm more so into the qualitative. Yeah, yeah. Da da da, and yeah. the quantitative. Uh, so I have plenty of stories to show. Yes. Yeah. Plenty of stories, okay, to show and testimonials from the youth of how these myths have just helped them. You know, just about a month ago, I had, I'm always getting the youth who are, you know, from who are now 21, 30 years old. Mm -hmm. Or I'm a, you know, wow, do you know that I'm, I'm, I'm still learning from these myths? I still got my journal. Oh. Um, um, so what they learn from the myths here again. You know, like if it's a common theme in myth, chances are it's a common theme in life. So, sure. so, the thing, so the thing is to take the things that you've learned in the myths and apply them to your life. Okay, so I got all kinds of testimonials if you need data, you know, to show, <laughs> <laughs> to show the impact, you know, the mm -hmm. impact. And, and mm -hmm. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I say this in all modesty. This is in all modesty. Uh, this is in all modesty. I've yet to see a, 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 another method that that is that works in such a quick fashion. Okay, our method is unique, engaging, and like I say, most importantly, it works. So I, that doesn't surprise me. At I don't have any trouble believing that. Yeah. And here's here's another thing. This is the way we used to yeah. teach yes. and yeah. initiate children and young people with mythological stories. But we don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're bringing it back. You've gone back and found the water of life and are bringing it yeah. to the culture, Kwame. Yes. Yeah. And now through your program training people in your method and in bringing it to more schools in New York, you are, you're, you're helping to distribute the water of life. You're helping yeah. this reach more people. I'm doing, I'm doing my best. Uh, you know, it's like, like Joseph Campbell said, you go into the forest and you, you know, you, you find gold and when you bring it out, it turns to dust. Yes. <laughs> okay. So it's just a matter of, you know, trying to convince, you know, it's kind of, it gets frustrating, but. What's um, frustrating? When you, when you know you have something that works and you got to keep, <laughs> you got to keep trying to convince people that it works. And I mean, it's like, it's so obvious that it works. Right. Okay. So that's right. the frustrating. And, and specifically, you've got to convince funders, presumably. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you, you know, we've never had a, 
fundraising campaign in 20 years. Never had a fundraising campaign in 20 years. We're in our 20th wow. year. So we're just now, this is our first year having, you know, having a major campaign. I have never, I have never asked anybody for money. Okay. Uh, I'm like, you know, in the water of life. Wow. Going back to that water of life myth. Um, I was sitting on the castle steps acting like everything was cool mm -hmm. when it wasn't. Yes. So the old yeah. man, the old man walked by. Okay. And so also in that water of life myth, the, the, the two older sons, you know, they don't get off their horse when the dwarf asks them, you know, where are you going in such a hurry? The youngest son, uh, the youngest son, he gets off his horse. Okay. So, so matter of fact, when we're doing the myth, I keep playing the drum, but then when, when it comes to the youngest son, the, the two older sons, they're thinking that they, if they secure the water of life, they become their father's favorite and inherit their father's kingdom. The youngest son, like I tell the youth, who's just about your age, just about your age. He doesn't <laughs> care about so becoming great. his father's favorite or, or inheriting the father's kingdom. He just wants his father to be well. So, mm -hmm. so when he mounts his horse, you, you know, the father asks him, well, you, you know, he asks, can he go in search of the water of life? Father says, no. He said, besides, your older two brothers couldn't bring it back. What makes you think you can? So the father relinquished, finally let him go. When the, when the youngest son runs into the dwarf and the dwarf asks him, where are you going in such a hurry? The youngest son gets off his horse and admits that he does not know where he is going. Okay, so that's one of that, you know, that's two quote unquote mistakes I made. Mm -hmm. um, I was sitting on the castle steps acting like everything was cool when it wasn't. And I, I didn't get off my horse, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to admit that I... I didn't know where I was going. Okay, so hey, that's what I'm doing now. I need help. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, help. and 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 you know this <laughs> this is this is an age old story that those of us who are gifted in certain areas, like in developing programs or creative ideas. Are usually not good nonprofit administrators. Yeah, so not, you didn't know about fundraising. No, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Alchemy has been alchemy has been successful in spite of me, not because of me. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, which shows you how powerful a friend yeah. of mine was telling me that he said that shows you how powerful the method is, that it can, that it can. Yeah you know, overcome me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't have a big uh, fundraising engine behind you, but you've no. done all of this remarkable yes. work. And, yes. you know, another thing that strikes me about it is that this is, this is an essentially not an expensive model. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. Uh, and that's, it's, it's been interesting, Lisa. Okay. And so then it gets back. I go back to, wow. Who, who's the common denominator in all this? I am. Okay. And then I get to blaming myself for alchemy, not <laughs> being further along than what we are. So, yeah. I mean, this idea of scaling the project, <laughs> I mean, that, that, that takes help. Uh, and yes. so yes. those of you out there that are listening, that are experts in how to scale beautiful programs okay. you know Kwame's the guy to reach out to because okay. there are people for whom that is exactly what they do and exactly yeah. what they know how to do yeah mm -hmm. appreciate mm -hmm. that joseph and lisa yeah. and and you do have a fundraising uh, effort now yes yes and yes. we we have a link to that so those of you who are incredibly moved by this as i know i am and and um uh, what is the goal what is the fundraising goal <sighs> For, for George Jackson, um, okay, we have Akron and we have New York. Okay. Okay, we have Akron and New York. So Akron, I believe that Akron, okay, we're still in the, in the stage. The formulating things. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. So Akron, I think it's like around 300,000, okay, for us to continue because mm -hmm. we're like in eight, eight schools in Akron. Okay, mm -hmm. so in Akron, it's like about 250, 300,000. In New York, George Jackson Academy, for us to continue at George Jackson Academy, it's only going to be like around 30,000, okay? Okay, for us, for, for, for like one year, okay, 30,000. There are entrepreneurs uh, that are listening to this right okay. now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is so, no joke. Yes. No, I know, this is no I joke. know. Yes. Because no. it yes. takes boldness just yes. to ask 
for yes. what you yeah. need. Yeah. Yes. The, the 300,000 there, the 30,000 in New York, yeah. there are people for whom that, that yeah. wouldn't even cause them to blush yeah. yes. to write a check like that. Yes. That's and, true. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and so for the training program, it'll probably be about another, I'm certain, I'm, it, it seems like we're going to get this one grant mm-hmm. through another, through another entity. Uh, but through the training might be another 40,000, maybe. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. but right now I'm, yeah. I'm trying to focus on George Jackson uh, so that I can stay with these 22 youth mm-hmm. for another two, two, two years. Okay, so that'd be 30 grand. That would be 30 grand, you know, September, then another 30 grand next September. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. If, if that, okay, if right. that, okay, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we'll have a link coming out for it specifically for the George Jackson, because because uh, like I can say that is my focus. I be- I believe we'll raise some money in Akron. That's, a, that's another thing. The, the myth of Parsifal. It took him twenty years. It, it took him twenty years to ask what ails the Fisher King. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And hey, it's been twenty years. When I was first, when I was first in the village, I didn't ask what what ails the Fisher King. So it took me <sighs> twenty years, and now hey, I'm asking. You know, what okay. else the Fisher King? Okay, so. We're, we're uh, here to amplify your voice. I want to switch tracks for just a second. And, um, you know, I, I, as you know, I'm, I'm a big fan. I love your work. And, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll share, too, that, you know, we, uh, Kwame came to Philadelphia and we did a, a, a public program that I attended. And so I got to be part of the process with the hunter and the boa constrictor. Oh, okay. And okay. it was so, something happened in that room. Something happened to the group. Something happened to me. It, it, was, uh, it was that little bit of magic that you know doesn't doesn't happen all the time but it's really powerful when it does it was it was a remarkable experience so i know firsthand how wonderful the work you do is and and i'm wondering can we just think together about um what's happening in the psyche of these young men when they hear these stories what what happened for me when you shared that story what what is what is how does this work I think, thanks, Lisa. I think, I think what happens is uh, they come to see. They say the best way to train a wild elephant is to yoke it to one that's already been through the process. This huh. way, the wild one comes to see, though startlingly different, it is still viable. Okay, so, so like, if, if, if and, and these are urban youth for the most part that I'm working with, okay? Yep. If you're, if you're told, if you're told, on a daily basis that, you know, you'll never be this, you'll never be that, you'll never be this, you'll never be that. You told that on a daily basis, that's kind of going to sink in. All right. Well, yeah. if that's the case, Jung's concept of anatodromia, that means the opposite holds true. So if you keep telling them that they can be this, they can be that, you can do this, you can, they will believe it. Okay. So with those myths, with those myths, you just keep pounding into them that, hey, you just like the hero in the story, okay? You come from the same background, all right? If he did it, you can do it, all right? So, so it's like in the myth, you just do a little bit of something every day, like in the, in the myth of the killing virtue, this, this cub puts his paw print in the paw print of his mother's every day and say, someday mm. I will be big enough. One day yeah. I will be strong enough, okay? And so it's about pounding away every day. Every day, you just do a little something every day, okay? And so like 10 years from now, you're going to be 10 years older anyway. So you might as well be 10 years older doing what you want to do. So it's about, it's about living those myths. It's about actually incorporating the character traits of those heroes into your own life, all right? So that's what it's doing. It's telling them, you know, unconsciously that, hey, I can do this, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Is it going to happen overnight? No, it's not going to happen overnight. All right. But hey, uh, you just keep persevering. Like you say, Joseph, when you don't give up hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that reminds me of that lovely Neil Gaiman quote. Neil Gaiman, of course, who, who kind of seems to has, have access to that mythological world, that quote, fairy tales are more than true. 
Not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can yeah. be beaten. There you go. There you go. There you go. So like, so like when the myths uh, say myths are stories that have never been, but will always be. Mm -hmm. Myths are false on the outside, but true on the inside. Myths are lies which tell the truth. Okay. <laughs> myths are not just for putting children to sleep, but for waking adults up. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. great. That's really so, great. Yeah. Yeah. I hear the lullaby of Manhattan yeah. behind you, Kwame. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I love this city, and, and, and perhaps more importantly, the city loves me. I like it's, this moment of silence. Uh, yeah. Works for me. Works for as me. The, as the sirens pass by, <laughs> gives us all a moment yeah. to, to reflect. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. I also Thank like you. the synchronicity that Kwame, you were just talking about uh, where the medicine needs to arrive. And then we hear the <laughs> sirens <laughs> uh, racing, <laughs> racing to the scene mm -hmm. to provide aid wow. and help wow. so there's some some so arc sweet. in all of there that you go. Mm -hmm. works for me <laughs> yeah 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 so anything else you want to share with us about your work or anything coming up well, or well i would like to yeah. just um, lean into a little bit of something that well, i mean there is something of a a, a national crisis right now for boys boys and very young men where well, they're being asked to reconceptualize their relationship to women. Mm. There's a powerful confrontation. There's a um, powerful demand that consciousness be brought. One of the difficulties, of course, is that leaves boys and men staring at women because they want things to work better. And because women are bringing the complaints then they're looking to women to tell them who to be, to resolve the tension. But that actually alienates somebody from themselves. So whether a girl is asking a boy who she should be, or a boy is asking a girl who, she sh or who he should be, that, that that as a source of transformation is so problematic. So what I hear you doing is not so much trying to get in the middle of that line of tension, but actually dropping back down to that archetypal layer. And as Jungians, you know, we think of that as archetypal healing, that all of the masculine behaviors of all kinds rise up from an archetypal substrata. And as that energy rises up, it encounters cultural images. And so by dropping back down to the archetypal layer to be revitalized, there's an opportunity to re-image that same energy in any number of new ways. So that's, that's one way that I understand the power of myth to reissue forces in new images. So one, I'm wondering if this is something that you're tracking with the young men that you're working with. And I'm wondering if these young men's relationships uh, with young women and with women in general is also changing as they go back to the wellspring and reimagine wow. what it means to be a man. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, uh, and th I didn't even know I was doing this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you know I think this. you're doing it. Okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, but I realized years ago, years ago, where through the myths, through the myths, as I said, with the golden age, with the golden age, it was a, it was a beautiful time. It was a glorious time. It was a time when everything was created with a sense of enchantment, and that's what we're attempting to do. Bring them when we're. I'm, quite, I'm, I'm 66 years old, so I was, you know, growing up, boys don't cry and all this, blah, 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 blah. But through the myths, it's okay for boys to cry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I, what I didn't know I was doing was 
we're bringing the masculine and the feminine together. Mm. Okay, so where there's a balance, there's a balance. And so, you know, like I said, wow, the, the one thing that was a ticket when those high school dropouts went around that circle, you know, and said when the last time they cried, okay, that's not something that you're going to find a lot of quote unquote tough urban men doing, young men doing. So yeah, so so to me, we're we're, we're bringing in that more soulful, yeah, compassion, empathy, uh, understanding of others. Okay, an understanding of others. What I was gonna say earlier, and here again, thanks so much, Joseph. Uh, uh, so many of the myths we deal with parent-child relationships, okay? So mm-hmm. when I talked about that first core group and I'm giving you those stats, you know, how many have graduated, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. What I'm, most, what I'm most proud of to date, about six of them are parents. Nine, 85% of those youth I work with didn't have their fathers in their lives. Wow. What, I'm, what I'm most proud of, about six of them are parents now and to see the love they have for their children. Okay, I'll see it on Facebook. And yeah. them being in their children's lives, okay? And like a friend told me, we making generational changes, okay? Because through these myths, mm-hmm. through these myths and them talking about things, they understand the importance, okay, of, of how to treat your child, how to treat, how to treat your wife or your girlfriend. Uh, so, yeah, so it's about, it's about going back to that golden age and treat, it's the golden rule, do unto others as you, you know, doing to yourself uh so it's yeah through the that, myths yeah right the energy of the masculine comes up from the substrata yeah and it invests the available images and yeah. let's just say that somebody only has you know i'm mythologically there's only six images in my mind of what that looks like mm-hmm. and all that archetypal energy is trying to force itself through just yeah. six options yeah <laughs> so by returning to the myth and helping helping them imagine Mm-hmm. options that they wouldn't have conceived of and then the other men that are facilitating yeah. sharing yeah. some of their stories which give them through the imagination images which are ways of embodying the myth that of course they weren't necessarily exposed to for whatever reason mm-hmm. then returns to them as options there you they go. didn't know that they had which are also full of life force because that archetypal level is barreling dynamism into these possibilities Mm -hmm. and the discovery of possibilities is another way of saying hope there you go there you go Mm -hmm. there you go Mm -hmm. uh uh, the death of hope is the death of possibilities and the resurrection of hope is the discovery of legitimate possibilities yeah Yeah. couldn't have said it better okay Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay and that's what we provide that's what we provide, all through mythological stories and fairy tales. And then, like you said, and that's one of the things, too, that's important about, about our process is that the adults, they have to be comfortable enough within themselves to share, to mm-hmm. share our, our halfness or incompleteness uh, so that the youth, so that, our, so that our sacrifices will not be in vain. You and know, Freud had a word made, for that. He said the first step to, for any change to happen is to puncture the neurotic isolation. Thank you, wow. And so to invite these boys out of their isolation. Mm. Yeah. Because the, the reason some of these excruciating behaviors, feelings, and beliefs sustain is that they're caught in a closed system, in an ouroboric mm-hmm. system. And inviting these boys to, to puncture their isolation, to punch through that membrane, yes. to enter into even just that room, that that, is, that step is essential for anything else to then change or be exposed to other forces, which is what yes. you're then doing alchemically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because the stuff that's in that isolated container is the prima materia. That's the, the troublesome substance mm-hmm. that is causing so much pain. And that has to break open so yeah. it can then be exposed to these archetypal medicines and substances. And then my sense is that, that you are there, you know, full of delight and wonder watching uh-huh. how the archetypal yeah. medicine yeah. changes 
this prima materia. Yes. Thus mm -hmm. it's alchemy. Yes, yes. Thank you here again. Well said. Uh, and it is, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the frustration. But the opposite of that is the, is the elation. The elation mm -hmm. and, the, and the gratitude that I get from seeing that, seeing that transformation take place. And, then, and the one thing, too, Joseph, as you were saying, you know, so all that is fine and dandy. All that is fine and dandy. But then once they secure the water of life, they got to come back. They got to come back and bring mm -hmm. it back Do something. You know, to the village. And so then, like I, like I tell the youth, you know, like when we're in Akron, they don't have to come back into Akron, Ohio, okay, and do it. And they don't even have to do it for a living. But, but, but at some point or another, you have to give back to those who have less than, okay, mm -hmm. at some point, at some mm -hmm. point. Uh, but yeah, it's about it's it's about becoming a hero within your own story. Yeah, I was I was gonna I was gonna pick up on that because um, Joseph, I'm so glad you you took it there because um, you know, in some sense, we probably don't talk about uh, I I want to say like almost the crisis of masculinity enough, and uh, it's something I um can't speak f f to from a first person perspective, but it it does matter to me and it. And and Kwame, I think the work you're doing is so so relevant uh, in that area. And and one way to think about it is you are constellating the hero archetype in these boys' lives. Yes, yes. Uh, so so it's interesting, uh, Lisa, because because uh, about six years ago we we trained like four women, so we have uh, four women running groups mm -hmm. in Akron. And so, uh, like for the training, it's not just for men, okay? So, you know, you know, we're also training women so that we have separate myths. We have uh -huh. separate myths for the girls, okay? Yep. Uh, to work on. So, so here again, uh, I love working with the youth, love working with the youth, but uh, I love working with the adults because they have so much more life to reflect upon. Mm -hmm. So, they're, so they're, their responses are just so just coming with a lot more life experience. But like I said, now those sixth graders at George Jackson Academy remind me of adults, okay, with the responses, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, with the responses that they have. Yeah, so uh, and I think I've been blessed. Men that are facilitating this work, you and the other uh, male facilitators, and of course the women that you're now training, that one of the things that we're drawn to in this work, I think, is that there's a part of our own inner boy shows up in the stories of struggle and suffering in all of the boys, which of course they feel. Yes. So you are with them. And when they tell their story of pain, something inside of you mm -hmm. cracks and a tear rolls down and the boys feel that. And that's something that may never be said, but doesn't need to be said. And that's part of helping them contain the suffering of having their pain emerge, as well as demonstrating this can be, yeah. this can be met at that mythic level. And there is something in the shared pain. So when you were saying the frustrations that you are experiencing in scaling the programs, getting them adequately funded, there is an entire field of frustration and pain <laughs> that you are in because the boys constellate that, that you are metabolizing not only your personal process, but metabolizing the stories, the general field of energy that these young men and boys yeah. are carrying. No doubt. No doubt. You, you had mentioned uh, about the tears, when the tear rolled down. And so when, when, whenever the youth tear up or the adults tear up, We'll take the tear. We'll rub it on the drum. We'll rub it on the drum oh, so that gosh. that way, the, that way, their the, their tears are not in vain. And when you hit the drum, their tears are reverberate. That is extraordinary. Yeah. That's yeah. That is extraordinary. Yeah. But, but then, but then, like you also said, you know, um, it's so important to me as far as youth because, like, when you're in, you know, going through a social worker counseling, they they're telling you not to divulge personal information. Mm -hmm. Well, well, mm -hmm. and I and I mm -hmm. get that, but how can we ask the youth? 
to share their story if we're not going to share it ourselves. So in alchemy, you're throwing that to the to the side of the yeah, road. Yeah. Okay. It's a different okay, container. Yeah. Different yeah. container. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, so so here again, the things that we share in that circle, you know, as adults, um, it amazes me. But here again, it just shows the trust that we have in the youth, mm-hmm. and in turn, it shows the trust that the youth have in us. Because yeah, I, I mean, some deep things have been shared in that circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm sure I'm so glad that you brought thank your you. drum and thank you gave you. us a little thank taste you. of thank it because it's just really magical. And and uh, you're you're gonna hang with us for the yes, the I jam am. Tr- awesome. yes, I am. Awesome. Yes, I am. Thank you both so much. Okay, I really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, it's yes, just thank a you. pleasure. Thank you. Let's jump into a, that mythic level as we look at a dream. This was submitted by a listener. She is a 19-year-old female. Currently, she is unemployed. And the title of her dream is Killing the Snake Self. I'm inside a one-room barn with a dirt floor, a deep ditch dug next to the inner walls like a moat and two planks of wood placed over the ditch that makes exiting possible. It's mid-afternoon. I am only in my underclothes. In the room with me is a pile of clothing, a dog, and a rattlesnake. The snake can talk, but the dog can't, and I'm aware that they are both me or a version of me. It begins very calmly with the snake and I make polite small talk as we lay in the sun, coming through the windows. However, the snake turns on me once I start putting on clothes to leave. The sun is beginning to set. The dog and I are locked in a battle with the snake, although the dog is mostly too scared to help, so I am left trying to stop the snake from hurting either of us while putting on my clothes. When I fall into the ditch, I discover the sides are lined with barbed wire, and I severely injure my hands, climbing out of it to save the dog. Eventually, I notice a pile of rusty tools and use a shovel to cut off the snake's head, but by then night had fallen, and I had been bitten by the snake five times, losing the ability to move my left leg. The dog is frightened, but completely fine. I am suddenly aware that I have a curfew and only have a short amount of time to return to the house nearby before I am locked out. I also know that if I get locked out, things are waiting in the night that will kill me if the poison from the snake bite doesn't. While I limp out of the barn, red emergency lights begin to flash and a strange combination of an alarm and the same four high-pitched notes on a violin play. As I start going up the road to reach the house, an ashamed-looking male friend drives past me, making eye contact with me but refusing to listen to my pleas for help. The dog ends, excuse me, the dream ends with the dog and I staring at the locked gates of the house. Now, for context, she shares, I am facing a major unknown chronic illness that prevents me from doing many of the things I like to do, like moving out of my parents' house or getting a job. Additionally, I injured my left leg, or injure my left leg in almost every dream I have. The main feelings in the dream, she writes, in the first half, it was very serene, with a bit of distrust towards the snake, and as the sun went down, it transitioned into fear and grim determination. By the end, it was mostly grief and dread. And she adds a few associations. I grew up around the house and the barn in the dream, although the real barn doesn't have a dirt floor or a ditch, and remember them fondly. I've never seen that particular dog or snake before, but I did used to have fun rattlesnake hunting with my grandfather. The stretch of road I had to walk up in the last part of the dream 
is actually a very specific back road that I spent a lot of time on when I was younger. The male friend is less of a friend and more of an acquaintance I was cordial with after I refused to go on a date with him, but no longer talked to after graduating high school. The violin is to my memory from Rhodes by Portishead. This is a really complex dream. It is a very complex <laughs> dream. Yeah. Indeed. And I and I, I also maybe I wanna just one one thing I'm holding in mind is that I feel like when there's something going on in the body, sometimes the dreams speak to that. And she mentions a chronic illness, but we don't know any more about that. So yeah. it it strikes me that the dream might be talking about that, but without more information, I think I won't try to go down that hole and I'll maybe just think about it more psychologically, but certainly if, if I were working with this person, I might be curious about that. I think it's, it's interesting that there's a dog and a rattlesnake and everything kind of seems copacetic and, and the snake can talk. Is that right? Yes. The snake talks, but the dog does not. So, um, talking snakes were clearly in the mythological realm. I'd be so curious about what the snake was saying. Exactly. And, uh, you know, one, one thing, uh, when there's, um, animals in a dream, you know, the, they're, the animal's always sacred in a dream, but it, but she, but, 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 uh, you know, if, if the, if the animal represents an aspect of the divine, um, sometimes you, you've got sort of competing um, uh, competing qualities, competing gods that that are uh, you know that they're they're in conflict somehow. They're mm -hmm. they're both um, an aspect of the divine principle, but these two particular principles in this dream are in conflict with one another, and. It's so interesting that the snake only turns on her after she starts putting on clothes. Exactly. Which, by the way, is the great sin in the Garden of Eden. That yeah. Adam and Eve are naked. They're having conversations with all the creatures, God and the serpent. And then when the certain serpent, I suppose, when they get a little bit too close to the serpent, suddenly. They want to put on clothes and hide themselves because they feel shame. So she's fine, just as you said, and she's in the garden and she's naked. When she puts the clothes on, mm -hmm. something in the psyche appears to not be happy. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, one just with that archetypal amplification, I'm curious about, although it's unspoken, shame. Mm -hmm. Has shame entered into the garden, and then that changes her relationship to within her psyche and also to these archetypal figures. And Joseph, you brought up this idea before about the neurotic isolation. This image of a barn with a moat around it. On the it does inside, have a, uh -huh. a moat, it does have yeah. a, a way to get out. There is like a little drawbridge yeah. that goes over the moat, but it's a moat. That also has barbed wire in it, so somehow this um so, somehow this this image of this barn it feels uh, almost womb like, but but also um, can, you know like no one's supposed to leave this apparently, or it, or it can only be done with great difficulty and and under duress. So so and I wonder too if the putting on clothes. I mean, I love your amplification of the Garden of Eden, but it's almost like. You know, it's everything's kind of great here when I'm when I'm in this barn and I'm not planning on leaving. But if you were planning on leaving, the first thing you might do would be to put on clothes. So the, the tension or the conflict comes maybe when she begins getting ready to to leave somehow or go out into the world. And the way that she needs to or feels she needs to put on a persona. So clothing is often, as we have often said, this mediating 
symbolic layer that we clothe our authentic self in in order to negotiate with the social environment. And it does seem that the snake, which is often a symbol of feminine wisdom, is not having it. And so it may very well be that the persona that she is putting on is causing more of a problem than she might realize, and the psyche is really fighting with her about that um, and feels that it's, it's worth having this kind of life-or-death battle with her. So, so I think at 19, I think of myself at 19, you know, we're still trying to figure out what kind of a persona to have to enter into the professional world or to begin a life. And it's very easy for us to adopt a persona that doesn't fit very well because we're just experimenting to mm-hmm. figure out how to make ourselves up as we come out. But it does feel like the snake, which is often a symbol of wisdom, the snake of wisdom is, is really against this. And while the dog may be companionable and anxious, the snake is the one that's making demands on the ego. And I like your um, tone, Lisa, of thinking of the snake as something of a god. Mm-hmm. carrying an enormous archetypal valence. Well, both both the snake and the dog um, mm-hmm. do in very different ways. You know, it's interesting that she says that the dog and the snake, she's aware they're both versions of her. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, again, if she were here, I'd say, well, in what way? Or, would it, you know, say more about that. Well, that's interesting. You know, I, I realize that I'm, I'm putting something on it, which is my idea that she's, by putting on clothes, she's getting ready to leave. But there is this reference earlier in the dream. There are two planks so that it is possible to exit. Mm-hmm. And, and somehow that's this key moment in the dream when the, when the kind of tone changes. And it goes from being very kind of pleasant. There's polite small talk. They're lying in the sun. But then when she puts on clothes, the sun is setting. Like something has really shifted. And, and in that sense, I wonder, I'm thinking of, um, for those of you familiar with Don Kalshed's work, a little bit of like the persecutor protector, like does the snake not want her to leave? I mean, snakes can symbolize wisdom and they can also symbolize death and regression. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. the, the snake bite uh, kind of pulls us into the unconscious. Jung wrote about that quite a bit. It kind of paralyzes us. And, and is somehow the snake bite and, or the snake attack an image of some wise ancient part of the psyche that, uh, for whatever reason, doesn't want to let her go out into life and is, is going to attack her and the dog. I mean, she's fighting to save the dog. And the dog are, Dogs are, are, you know, another very complex symbol, can mean lots of things, but they are uh, at least, you know, one version of what a dog can represent is helpful instincts. You know, dogs work with us. So they're sort of that, they're instincts that are um, kind of, uh, you know, in service to the ego. They, they're, they're companions um, and they, they, you know, they can help us do things. Somehow the snake doesn't want the dog, I mean, the girl, the dreamer, or, or the dog to, to leave, perhaps. Doesn't mm. wa- you know, the other thing about clothes, let me just say one yeah, more yeah. thing. There's a persona, pile of clothes she's digging through, by yes, the way. Yes, yes. Um, persona, yes. But also, we need clothes to be adapted to the outer world. Mm-hmm. So I, I do wonder if there's, you know, she's at this important threshold when, she should be leaving home, getting a job, but, you know, she can't because of the, the illness. Um, so, you know, she, she needs to cross that threshold out of the barn mm-hmm. and, uh, and adapt to the outer world. And there may be a, a, a very important inner snake that for, for reasons that are a little mysterious or, you know, no, you know, you're not going to well, leave. I wish she was here to just fill in details in the dream. Because when she says, however, the snake turns on me once I start putting on the clothes to leave, I would love to know exactly 
what the image is that tells yeah. her that. Yes. And then the dog and I are locked in a battle with the snake. I would, I would be so important to see the onset of that because it's not uncommon for the dream ego to attack an inner figure because it decides that it's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know whether the snake instigated the attack or whether the snake was just saying, hey, don't leave me alone. You mm -hmm. know, and then she's uh, going after the snake. Mm -hmm. So we're missing so much information. But we can guess that, um, well, one question I would, of course, have is, what made it seem like going to war with the snake was the only option? Mm -hmm. Because the snake is in dialogue with her. And I am kind of wondering, couldn't the debate, the dialogue have continued much in the way that Jung in the black books and then in the red books, he's in dialogue with these inner figures and sometimes he's agreeing or disagreeing. They're making demands. He pushes back. But it's the maintaining of the dialogue that creates the tension. But here, the dream ego has decided that the tension with the snake has to end with the snake being killed and mm -hmm. pushed back into the unconscious. Mm -hmm. So more, I just have a wish I had <laughs> this person here to ask a lot of questions to, and then in, in battling with the snake, that's when she falls into the ditch that she's lost track of the option of crossing mm -hmm. the bridge. Mm -hmm. to just safely escape. Yeah, and then there's this this image of, you know, sort of desperately trying to get to the house in time to save her life, losing, um, you know, the ability to use her left leg, which I think is interesting, and, uh, and, then, and then finding herself locked out. So, so, you know, it's sort of like, uh, somehow the, the, that encounter didn't go well. <laughs> It's also that our, the Garden of Eden again, that, you know, once they're thrown out of the garden, this flaming cherub is set at the front door of the garden saying, you can't come back. So something has happened in the barn where she's been bitten by the serpent. Something is now in her. And I'm not sure that she can go back. Mm -hmm. Can you go back to the childhood home? after the serpent of wisdom has filled you with ideas which at first are venomous, but if engaged in the right way, become a kind of medicine. And the early analysts thought of the analytic interpretation, which is so painful to the ego, as a kind of serpent venom, that the wisdom of what you're up to infects you. You feel sick with the insight. And then if you can metabolize the poison, which means I've got to change. Mm -hmm. but now that I see yeah. myself, this is awful. Yep. Then we come out wise, but having gone through the being made sick by the insight. And so there's five, if we think about it that way, five insights, five mm. venomous insights have been delivered to her. And she stands there and can, is not welcome to go back to the child complex because she's 19 and she's worried about a curfew. Mm. So the parental complexes are just totally in charge. I'm going to get in trouble. If I, if I don't obey mom and dad, I'm going to get in trouble. And you can't go home. Mm. The way is blocked, which is upsetting to the ego and what I would suspect is something she needs to integrate. You can't go back to being a child, even though you're sick, mm -hmm. even though you feel you can't work and you feel sick with the venom of truth. Mm. You can't really go back to being a baby. But so we do I've, regress when we get sick. I mean, that happens. Yeah, that's, that's really great, Joseph. I, 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 uh, I think you really landed it. And I'm, I'm aware that we're back into this idea of initiation. And uh, Kwame, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just, do you have any thoughts? 
Um, <laughs> you can you can you can beg off if you don't want to do okay. this. We'll just no, we'll nip uh, it out. But. No. Uh, <laughs> what what came to mind for me was wow. Like I said, the, the the dog and the snake. And so when I was thinking about the dog, I was thinking about the the lower the lower animal nature. Where mm-hmm. the snake, I was thinking, wow, that's the higher the higher, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and so like they're, they're in conflict with one another. And then I was, and then when she said that time limit, she had, there's only so much time she has, uh, you know, that's what resonated uh, with me. And then, but then like, I said, wow, also what resonated, she's stuck in that trench with barbed wire. Yeah. Okay. So, wow. So, so yeah, that, that was the only thing that, that, uh, like I said, I'm, I feel like I'm so out of my realm here because I don't read like I used to. When I used to read, then I was, you know, a little bit better. But you this know up. how to work with symbolic yeah, material. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. All, it's so, yeah, so it's a time. To, but then also, too, she said something about her, the, the boy, ex-boyfriend or. Oh, right, the so, guy in the car. We didn't even talk about him. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. That that resonated with yep. me too. That, that felt resonated important. with me that too. Felt important. Okay. Uh, but yeah, yeah, but then but then like Joseph said, wow, she can't go back to that child like nature, even though, you know, she might want to. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that she this is like someone she turned down for a date, I guess, and then he was kind of cold to her after that. Um yeah, there's something there about being, being you know, that the, he drives past her and ignores her cries for help. So there's a way where she feels very alone, I think. So. And when I think of the, uh, the lamentation for help, um, it is part of the, the painful medicine from the psyche is that that stance, again, is kind of what a puppy might do or a baby might do is this kind of crying and helplessness and i think that the animus um is not in support of that attitude and there may be some other way that she could engage the the animus in order to get something she needs but crying for help again feels like that it's young and, and helpless, there must be some other stance. And, and I don't know exactly what that would be. Mm-hmm. But generally, when something's not rewarded in a dream with a positive response, we're thrown back upon ourselves and asking, how am I gonna how am I gonna get this <laughs> to change? How am I gonna solve this problem if if crying out for help isn't isn't the way forward? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also think that um, the idea that she's cut off the snake's head, but a part of the snake is now lives in her. Mm-hmm. That that yes, it's the venom of wisdom, but also it's part of the snake. And, and the fantasy I have is that she will now have to become part snake. It's a little like Rappuccini's daughter. Mm-hmm. You know, she becomes a poisonous flower, being exposed to poisonous flowers, and that she needs to be more like the serpent of wisdom and less like an affable, voiceless puppy mm-hmm. that just kind of is companionably and anxiously next to someone, much like a child might be, a toddler, without words yet. And needing to be protected, that maybe it's the snake that should have been prioritized, not the puppy and not getting home for curfew. And I would have to say that if any of us sitting in this room in a naturalistic environment found a talking snake, I'd probably <laughs> hang around and wouldn't say, nine o'clock, gotta get home. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. this is wild. I think I'm yeah, gonna yeah. stay for, you know, yeah, until yeah, the, yeah. the snake is done, you know? A I god think- is talking to you. Yeah, that, that's that, that's another thing. Because uh, in the myth, you say she's understanding the language of animals. Yes. Okay, yes. so that's pretty cool. Slytherin, <laughs> she can understand snakes, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty cool. You know, it's one more thing I'll say is that there's there's a couple images of cutoff in the dream. There's 
or in the in the and they're surrounding the dream there's the cutting off of the snake's head mm -hmm. and then also there's this young man who asked her on a date she refused him they were cordial but after graduation they no longer talk mm -hmm. so there's been a cut off with you know I, I'm, I'm not literalizing it to say that person but maybe a cut off from her own kind of masculine potential or something so uh yeah, there that seems to be and then of course she's she's mostly cut off in the barn. Mm -hmm. So so something something's not gone well, I think. And of course there's always another chance in the psyche. So thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.